1799, the keeper of the Department of Natural History at the British Museum didn't know what to make of a bizarre specimen that had just arrived from Australia. It appeared to be the skin of a beaver or a mole with a beak sewn onto it. Being a good curator, he carefully examined every inch of the specimen and published a detailed description of its many weird features. But he wasn't convinced it was even a real animal. He wrote, and I quote, I ought perhaps to acknowledge that I almost doubt the testimony of my own eyes with respect to the structure of this animal's beak. The beak met the body so perfectly, and the animal was just so strange that, for a hot second there, he suspected that the specimen was a fake. But the arrival of more specimens confirmed that he was dealing with a 100% genuine creature, with the bill of a duck, the tail of a beaver, and the feet of an otter with venomous spurs. The animal, of course, turned out to be a duck-billed platypus. But perhaps the weirdest thing about it was that it was a mammal that laid eggs. The platypus belongs to an unusual group called monotremes that diverged from the branch of the mammal family tree that leads to marsupials and later placentals around 186 million years ago. And although they might not look like it, eggs were a huge evolutionary innovation. They saved those animals known as amniotes from extinction and may have set the stage for their invasion of dry land. While the identity of the first animal to lay eggs is still a mystery, paleontologists can estimate when this creature came about and what it might have looked like. And they're teaming up with geneticists and biologists who study living animals to understand why and how most mammals lost this incredible egg-laying innovation. Turns out that might have all started with a chance encounter with a virus. The story of the egg spans millions of years, from the first vertebrates that dared to venture onto dry land to today's mammals, including the platypus. And of course, birds. You know, like chickens? Yes, I'm here to tell you, fam. The egg came first. Okay, now there are eggs, and then there are eggs. The earliest eggs of any kind were laid in water, accompanied by a thick layer of jelly, like frogs do today. And yeah, it's literally just called jelly. And this jelly is a good home for amphibian embryos as long as everything stays wet. But about 385 million years ago, in the Devonian period, tetrapods started venturing away from the water's edge. Competition was high in aquatic ecosystems, and the only animals on land were invertebrates, like insects and spiders, which probably enticed tetrapod ancestors out of the water. But in order to become truly terrestrial, tetrapods had to be able to keep their embryos wet on dry land. One of the first vertebrates to live and maybe reproduce on dry land was Cassinorhea. It lived during the Carboniferous period, around 334 million years ago, in what's now Scotland. And it mixed some of the amphibian features of its ancestors, like unfused shoulder bones, with features associated with reptiles, like strong leg and backbones. And some experts think it resembled a new group of creatures that would appear in the fossil record about 20 million years later, the first true amniotes. These animals laid a new kind of egg, one surrounded by a tough, leathery shell. The shell helped protect the embryo from diseases and attacks, but was also porous enough to let gases reach the embryo so it could breathe and grow. And the waterproof membranes and the amniotic fluid inside the egg created a self-contained pond so the embryo stayed hydrated. And you gotta stay hydrated. Suddenly, animals didn't have to spend their lives in the swamp anymore. It was a huge boost for adventurous tetrapods that were colonizing dry land. Then, parts of the planet that had been tropical and humid started to cool and dry up, an event called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, which I've talked about before. The swamps began to disappear, and many amphibian groups went extinct. But the amniotes, being better adapted to drier conditions, expanded into a variety of new niches and dominated the land. But what were the steps between embryos and jelly and embryos and shells? Well, we don't know, because of what's known as the egg gap. Some of our earliest fossil records of amniote eggs are from dinosaurs, like Mosaurus patagonicus, which lived around 215 million years ago in Argentina. And that's at least 100 million years after when we think the egg first appeared. So the initial 30% of the history of the amniote egg unfolded without leaving a trace. Because eggs, especially soft-shelled leathery eggs like we'd expect to see in early amniotes, don't fossilize well. So without that proof, paleontologists have to rely on inferences based on closely related animals for which they do have hard evidence, a technique known as phylogenetic bracketing. Since reptiles, mammals, and birds are all amniotes, amniote eggs must have existed in their last common ancestor, the first true amniote. Fossils of the earliest unquestionable reptile, and therefore the earliest known amniote, come from Nova Scotia and are dated to around 310 million years ago. They're from a cute little creature called Hylonymus. So the egg must be older than that. What we do know is that the tail of the egg diverged into two separate storylines around 315 million years ago, when amniotes split into two major groups. One was the sauropsids, which would include reptiles, dinosaurs, and birds. The other was the synapsids, the ancestors of mammals. And these two groups put their eggs in very different baskets. Sauropsids mostly kept laying eggs throughout their evolutionary history, although they'd end up laying different kinds of eggs. Some reptiles continued laying eggs like those of early amniotes, which were soft and leathery, like turtles still do today. 
But birds, and their predecessors, the dinosaurs, eventually started forming a different type of egg, one that had calcium in the shell. This made them much stronger and also more likely to fossilize, which is why we have those fossil eggs from the saurus. Now, the other group, the synapsids, took a much more complicated path. Like sauropsids, early synapsids probably laid primitive amniote eggs with flexible shells, but there's no fossil evidence of their eggs either. But we know that in just over 100 million years, the ancestors of mammals made huge strides. They went from scaly, lizard-like creatures like Ophiacodon to fully warm-blooded, furry creatures with mammalian jaws and middle ear bones. And at some point, synapsids even evolved mammary glands when they were still laying eggs. At first, these glands possibly served as a source of water to help keep eggs hydrated. But later, they became a source of milk for feeding young after they hatched. Milk is something that all mammals do, even the ones that lay eggs. Enter the monotremes. This new group of synapsids branched off around 186 million years ago during the early Jurassic period. This was the last group of synapsids to branch off that still laid eggs. And these ancient egg layers probably reproduced a lot like today's monotremes do. The mother platypus, for example, keeps her fertilized shelled eggs inside for a long time before she lays them. While they're inside, the embryos take in a lot of nutrients from the mother and are developed enough that they hatch in less than two weeks. And we think monotremes have been doing it more or less that way this whole time. But finally, around 160 million years ago in the late Jurassic period, the ancestors of placental mammals and marsupials appeared. These were the Therians, like Jeremiah, a toothy shrew-like mammal known from China. Now, the steps that happen between having eggs and having actual pregnancies in our mammal ancestors are mysterious, because you guessed it, there's not much fossil evidence. But once again, researchers can turn to living mammals to try to figure out what happened. One piece of the puzzle could be changes in gene expression. Because the main membranes of an amniotic egg, known as the sac, the chorion, and the allantois, are all present in animals that give birth to live young. They're just used in different ways. Mammals still form an amniotic sac around their young, but the placenta, the organ that provides material to the embryo from the mother, is actually formed from the chorion and allantois membranes of the egg. So mutations may have changed how the pieces of the amniotic egg were used, leaving mammals with an entirely new reproductive strategy as a result. Another idea is that therians followed a path similar to the monotremes, where eggs were retained in the mother's body for longer and longer periods of time. And this also might have happened through changes in the expression of genes, in this case in the genes involved with egg retention or embryo development. Yet another piece of the puzzle could be unusual proteins called syncytins. These proteins help cell membranes fuse together, and their most important role in mammals is developing the placenta. What's interesting about syncytins is that they didn't evolve in mammals. They've been part of our genome since before therians were even a thing. Syncytins are actually what's left of an ancient form of glycoproteins, which make the outer shells or envelopes of some viruses. But they're also found in modern mammals. So, researchers think that more than 190 million years ago, some retrovirus attacked one of our mammal ancestors and inserted bits of its genetic material into its host DNA that made that viral protein. And over time, that viral DNA was repurposed into new genes in mammals. So today's mammals, including you, still carry pieces of this ancient virus with them. But instead of connecting parts of a virus together, they're used to build a placenta. So it may be that a chance encounter with a virus kick-started the process that led to mammals no longer laying eggs. The evolution of the shelled egg was a milestone in animal evolution, helping those first amniotes take over the land. And the sauropsids and the synapsids put their own spin on the amniotic egg, ones that we can see today in living birds, like the chicken, and in monotremes, like the platypus. So by digging into the genomes of these living amniotes, we can start to tell the story of how and when the egg came first. Big thanks to this month's excellent eontologists. Kelly is making me say this. Patrick Seifert, Jake Hart, John Davison Ng, Sean Dennis, and Steve. Remember, backers have access to our Eonites only podcast. So go to patreon.com slash eons and pledge your support. And as always, I want to thank you for joining me in the Constantine Haza studio. Be sure to subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more celebrations of ancient life. Callie, <laughs> don't make me say this.